personalities i request shri prabhat pankaj ji to give us uh, his lecture we are eagerly looking forward to what he has to say to help us uh, in our endeavor to educate ourselves thank you thank you thank you so much sir so first of all i would like to uh, express uh, my gratitude and thanks uh, to jigyasa forum uh, and this is a wonderful opportunity for uh, for me and my my friend anand who has joined me uh, this morning uh, two of us actually uh, do a little bit of work in happiness uh, and it will be our pleasure to share our experiences uh, with you uh, i would also like to take this occasion to thank uh, professor sok bapna and rajendra bhanavar ji uh, they are the mentor for our institute they are also in our academic board uh, and they, they under their guidance uh, we are doing quite a lot of bit of work here so perhaps they thought that uh, this is uh, a good topic that uh, we can share our experiences and our learnings with you um, i would also like to introduce a little bit uh, our friend uh, anand r anand uh, who has joined me uh, today this morning uh, r anand he is uh, currently the senior advisor to hcl technology uh, he is uh, one among the top hr consultant in the country today uh, and he is an ex happiness expert uh, is actually a compatible uh, compatibility between me and professor anand uh on this particular subject because uh, there are two distinct dimensions of happiness that has come to surface uh, in the research field one is uh, uh, looking at it through the economics uh, perspective how happiness can be used as a public policy and second uh, from the individual psychology perspective which talks about the mental health you know well being and other things uh, 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 anand is an expert in psychology a clinical psychologist and he has also brought about a book on happiness at workplace so he is an expert in individual happiness uh, i'm looking at happiness from the aggregate the policy point of view so we thought that these are the two legs on which the happiness should move uh, so today's talk is going to be a combination of what i'm going to present to you uh the the individual approach to happiness as well as the aggregate approach to happiness so and we are trying to present you uh you know some of the basic findings of what we have learned from happiness so with this introduction let me uh just uh share my ppt uh the arrangement of the talk should be would be like like this that i'll be talking about uh, 30 minutes um uh, and then i will uh, hand it over to anand ji to uh, take it forward and talk about some 10 15 minutes and uh, we'll take all together 40 45 minutes to make our presentation and after that we would like to interact more with you your views your experiences your questions uh, uh, we can't ensure all the questions will be answered because we are among the one of the most elitist group uh, of intellectuals in our country uh, you all have your own experiences uh, with you and we have a lot to learn from you uh but we'll try to you know address those uh, queries and uh seek your suggestions for the uh, what else can be done in this area and do you really think that this is a subject that we should pursue further so uh, what we are going to focus it uh, is on the lessons from the happiness research and practice there are many nuances of happiness and it is viewed in a variety of ways uh but what we have picked up today is to talk uh, strictly from the research point of view uh Uh, we do talk about happiness in many ways uh, but this is one way to talk about happiness so uh, for this particular forum uh, we have decided to talk from the research angle so we are going to quote some of the fantastic work that has been done in happiness and we try to link it the subject in such a way that you understand get a grasp of what is happening in uh, happiness research we'll also uh, put a little bit of uh, you know emphasis on practice of happiness so how the countries uh, at the aggregate level or the policy level uh, happiness is being pursued and what is happening to the happiness in individuals life uh, as far as its practice is concerned so we are going to focus on research as well as on practice uh the best way to begin with is to begin from the beginning i i, I believe and uh it can can't be better than to begin with uh, richard davidson's work so you know it's a very famous work that he has done on mind mapping and uh he talked about neuroplasticity so you know probably anand is going to be the right person to talk about neuroplasticity uh and mind mapping but uh what he started with is uh, very intriguing 
said that our brain is such that it has been over time been shaped by different forces around us okay. uh, and we do not even notice those forces how our brains are being shaped by these forces uh, and then he said that you know uh, the forces which is shaping our brains do we have a uh, Uh, awareness about it do we know which forces are shaping our brains and he said that we have little knowledge about the forces which are shaping our brain and that our brain is constantly being shaped so that's the, that's the problem he poses in front of us uh, uh, can i can i request uh, ranjan ji to yeah sorry uh, so he actually what he did was that he text uh, three questions to people Uh, he asked them uh, the first questions like, "What are you doing right now?" So they asked the people, "What are you doing right now? Can you tell us what are you doing right now? Are you aware about what you are doing right now?" So that's the question he asked. Very interesting question. And then he asked the second question, uh, "Where is your mind at this moment? Is your mind on the thing that you are doing right now, or your mind is somewhere else?" You know, that's the question. He talked about that. It's very interesting. And then he also asked, "How happy are you? Uh, you know, in your life?" in your life uh, and these three questions he analyzed and he found very staggering result he said that 47% of people whom he actually sent this questionnaire uh, to answer they were actually lost in wilderness and they were not aware about what they were doing right now so that means their mind was not focused on what they're doing right now uh, their mind is somewhere else they're doing something else he also gave an example that quite often it happens with you it happens with me it happens with everybody when you start reading a book you read one 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 page of the book then you read the second page of the book then you read the third page of the book and by the time you read the third page of the book you forgot completely what you have read in the first page and second page of the book you actually and that's what he he call it neuroplasticity you know how mind is being shaped by certain factors which is actually causing loss of well being uh and some of the factors he actually indicated is very very important for us to understand he said that the first factor which actually causes the failure of well being is distractibility you know uh distractibility uh, he talked about the wandering mind and uh, his his theory is that the wandering mind is not a happy mind Uh, and here lies the clues to happiness the individual happiness we'll talk about it in a while the second he talked about the attention deficit is that people who have uh, you know severe attention deficit and people who have attention deficit will be less likely to be happy that's what uh, he indicated that's a loss of well being uh, we generally get the third he talked about was a moderate to high level of loneliness a uh, staggering result you see what he presented was that 76% of people Uh, whom he actually interviewed were found to be moderately or high level of suffering from high level of loneliness uh, and he said that the uh, loneliness is an un- early indicator of mortality uh, and then say that is is a stronger predictor even in comparison to obesity so i mean that's the that's the significance he attaches to the to the loss of well being due to loneliness uh, the next uh, he talked about is the negative self talk uh and depression he said that depression is on the rise uh and it actually uh, gets 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 uh, inflated uh by how we actually introspect and what kind of narrative we make for ourselves so he said the self talk uh what is that self talk uh, narrative that you generate for yourself and that is the indicator of uh, how quickly or how well or uh, you're going to navigate out of depression so that's very important uh, point that he raised uh then he talked about suicide rates so he said that you know you look at the women suicide rate has increased by almost more than 30% and uh, the surprising thing is that the the, the 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 suicide rate among the teen is also arising so that's very very disturbing actually uh it's, it's a complete loss of well-being and the fourth point is very very intriguing and is very important for all of us to consider he said that a pervasive loss of purpose and meaning in life uh and that is very very important that we have to you know uh, it's a early predictor uh, a pretty uh, and he took it as an early predictor of death uh you know and, and you can see the finding he said that the people in their 60s uh with low purpose in life are over two times as likely to die within 5 years as those with high levels you know uh Uh, if you have a high level of purpose in life and you have a low level of purpose in life it makes a lot of difference uh, on mortality uh, so these are all the 
uh, things that he talked about. And then he went on to explain how, uh, how we can nudge uh, our brain, how we can nudge our behavior, how we can nudge people in order to uh, cope with these failures of well-being and increase happiness in life. So we are going to come back to that, uh, the solution part, but uh, I'll take you through another study, which has been one of the celebrated study in happiness. Uh, it's called the study of adult development, and it was done by the Harvard University professors. So this is the longest, uh, you know, the largest, longest longitudinal study available uh, with us. It's, this study actually, actually expands for, for 70 years, uh, almost 70 years. And there are four generations of researchers who have gone into doing this study. Uh, and they have tracked the life of Harvard alumni, uh, 268 lives, right from 19 years age to till their death. Uh, they have tracked them, their life. Uh, in a variety of ways and interventions and questionnaires and interviews. Uh, and this study is a wonderful study that we have to understand life. So, you know, uh, what these lives, uh, which has been tracked by the researchers, four generation researchers can tell us. So there are three aspects I have taken. It, it, it's a huge study. There's a lot of thing that incorp is incorporated in the study, but I have picked up only three uh, for the relevance of the talk today. So first is how important is our childhood in predicting how we age? So when we age, when we grow old, uh, is the childhood matters for that? How we grow old, does it relate to how we spent our childhood? That's the one question that, that this study actually focuses. Second, is the die cast in the midlife? Or what is the significance of midlife uh, for how we age? So when you reach the age of 70, 80, uh, does it also decided how you're going to live at 70 and 80 in the midlife or in the early childhood? No, and that's a very interesting question that all of us would be interested in knowing how it actually relates. And the third, who retires and who enjoys it and why? You know, after retirement, who are the people who enjoys it most and who are the people who actually gets retired and say that, no, they're, 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 they're done. Uh, so I'm, I'm presenting uh, one finding uh, from this study. Uh, they're saying childhood factors do not actually predict much about life at 17 and 18. So it's a childhood uh, you know, you may have a different childhood, uh, but it is not going to be a predictor of how you're going to live life at 17, 18. So on the one hand, you can see warmth of childhood, childhood temperament, parental so, uh, social class, uh, ancestral longevity. So these are the factors that has been tracked in this study. And they have actually tried and relate it with the physical health, uh, length of active life, life satisfaction and mental health. So what was found is that the warmth in the childhood, if you get a lot of warmth in the childhood, it will have a positive, big positive impact on your mental health. Uh, it will have a positive impact, but not that big on the physical health. And your ancestral longevity also actually explains a little bit about your length of active life. Rest of the factors actually do not explain how you live at 70 and 80, uh, how you led your life in childhood. So childhood is not a very strong predictor of how you're going to live life at 70 and 80. So where is the clue to the, to the, to the old life? Uh, a life of the age. The clue lies in the midlife, actually, the midlife, uh, which starts from 40, 40s and your 50s. That is where it makes a lot of difference how you're going to live in 70 and 80. So this is what the study says. Uh, so they have taken uh, four factors. So the smoking, uh, alcohol use, abuse, exercise, stable marriage. And then they related it to the four factors of physical health, length of active life, life satisfaction, and mental health. And you can see smoking and alcohol abuse, they actually will reduce your physical health, length of active life, life satisfaction, as well as mental health. Smoking, of course, do uh, have a neutral impact on the life satisfaction that you can have at 70 and 80, but rest of the factors will have actually a uh, negative impact. But there is a a double positive impact of exercise and the stable marriage. That's what they are saying. Uh, so, you know, you have a good physical health, length of active life, life satisfaction, uh, and mental health. Uh, exercise and the life satisfaction may not be that correlated, but other things are very highly correlated. So the positive aspect of how you do your, how you lead your life, how you organize your life in 40s and 50s are going to be the predictor of how you're going to live your life in 70s and 80s. That's what the study says. Uh, on the retirements, who retires and who enjoys and why? So there are a couple of points that I would like to put forward. 5% uh, retired prior to age 60, most due to ill health. That's what uh, he observed, uh, the study observed. 
fifty percent still worked full time at age sixty five. Uh, by the age seventy five, only one out of twelve men had not retired. Uh, so you know uh, you can you can look at the data. And then the last one it says the men who liked working uh, the most at the age sixty liked retirement the most as is as a, uh, at age seventy five. So you know the study clearly indicates that how you organize your life at forties and fifties, and by the time you become sixty, if you are still active, you are able to make yourself active, uh, engaged in pursuit and work, uh, you are going to enjoy your life more at the age of seventy and eighty. So that's what uh, the study actually point out. And very clearly, the study says that there is a positive correlations between the education and longevity. Uh, how learning and education is actually related to longevity, and this study actually testifies that. It says that those who are actually college men, uh, 237 samples, you can see the red line. Uh, it can reach up to 75. People who have actually reached 70, 75 years of age of longevity are the one who were the college men. So those who have actually constant uh, adopted education and the constant learning as the mode of life, uh, they, uh, their longevity have been found to be better. Uh, what are the four ingredients of happy retirement? So this is a summary of this work I would like to present in front of you. One, replace workmates uh, with other social networks. So when you lose out your workmates, uh, you need to create an alternative circle of social networks. Uh, that is the clue uh, to happy life, a happy retirement life. Second, readers discover how you play. Uh, so you know, play, 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 play uh, you know, uh, plays a very important role uh, in how you're going to live your life happily uh, after retirement and engage in creative endeavors. The more creative you become, the better you feel uh, and learn new things. So learning uh, is the hallmark of life and learning and longevity actually are related to, closely related to that. So these are the four findings that this particular study tells us. Now on the, uh, on the international research front, we do have this World Happiness Report that comes every year. So this is the report of 2020 which is available on the net, you can have a look at that. And if you look at the ranking of the countries that has been made on the basis of this happiness research, Finland tops uh, the, the rank and in the top 20, uh, India does not figure anywhere. Uh, and these, uh, the happiness explained by this, uh, uh, this, this uh, you know, report, uh, there are factors like uh, they have taken GDP per capita, uh, social support, health, life expectancy, freedom to make the life choices, uh, generosity, and perception of corruption. So these are the factors uh, which they have considered in ranking the country on the base of happiness. So you, uh, we must be wondering where, the, where India lies uh, in this report. Uh, the Sri Lanka is at 130, India is at 144, uh, and the last is Afghanistan. So you know you can make the difference between the countries and you can see how this is happening. But the important thing to note in this report is that the kind of uh, six factors that it actually counts on. There are four factors uh, that explains countries' happiness. Uh, they are actually the social environment they are talking about. It's not the monetary environment they are talking about. So out of six, four are social environment. So they are saying, uh, you know, someone to count on. Do you have someone to count on? Uh, having the sense of freedom uh, to make life decisions. Uh, generosity, trust, you see, these, these are all the social capital they're talking about. Uh, so the happiness uh, largely depends on social capital. Professor Jeffrey Sachs is right when he said, time and again, we see the reasons for well-being include good social support networks, social trust, honest governments, safe environment and healthy lives. So these are the social dimensions of life that we create for ourselves and the country that actually are the indicators of happiness. But there is one more aspect this report actually highlights. It, it talks about the inequality. And they're saying a uh, good social environment is, is, is there, but you know, inequality actually is a very big ingredient of good social environment. And Richard Laird is one of the you know, uh, very prominent researcher in happiness. He says that people actually would like to live in a society uh, without extreme disparity in the quality of life. So we don't feel good living in the society which has got extreme disparity. So inequality actually plays a very important role. So what are the three lessons that uh, we have learned from happiness research? Uh, the first, it says that wealth is not enough for happiness. You know, the money, uh, you know, uh, the incessant, uh, our urge to, to crave for money, uh, it doesn't lead to a better happy life. That's the, the first lesson that we learned. Second is happiness is measurable. 
uh, and it is accessible. So, you know, it has been made possible by researchers. They have adopted a lot of methodology. I'm not going into that, the methodology of measuring happiness, but if the question is, questions are, uh, is asked, then we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Third, happiness can be promoted via public policy. That's what he said. So one of the, you know, way uh, to look at is uh, what Amartya Sen has written, a whole chapter he has devoted in the idea of justice. He talked about capability approach to happiness in idea of justice. What he said is that with a similar circumstances to two people, uh, the capability to be happy will differ. So some people will be much happier with a given circumstance. With the same circumstance, the other people, other set of people may not be very happy. So if there is something called capability to be happy, uh, there is also the possibility that it can, this capability can be enhanced. And that's the reason why, you know, the focusing on happiness research, happiness training becomes important because people can be made to be happy. And research has actually proved that up to 25% happiness can be added through training. So, uh, uh, when we look at this particular you know uh, study uh, by john halliwell uh, the Easterlin's work there's a lot of literature that has gone into it so there is a three wave of survey they have taken and they have related it to the happiness uh, in american uh, economy and it found that uh, Easterlin has pointed out that the american per capita gdp has increased by a factor of two over a period of 40 50 years but the average happiness has not actually increased in one of the survey uh, long term survey uh, it has been found that it has actually decreased. So people have started questioning the preamble of uh, the constitution of America. And they're asking the question, what happened to the pursuit of happiness? Because the preamble of um, uh, US constitution says that we are in the pursuit of happiness. So people started asking this question, what happened to the pursuit of happiness? And there's a lot of debate that is going on and people started focusing on that. When I, you know, uh, this, this is a scatter diagram we created, uh, income and happiness cross country, uh, you can see the trend very well that, you know, the countries are moving up and then going to the right hand side and then uh, flattening out. So this means that uh, the relationship between income uh, and the happiness is something like, you know, inverted U-shaped curve where there is going to be a peak. Uh, peak means that the income is going to contribute to happiness up to a particular level, but beyond that income level, uh, happiness is not contributed by income, it's contributed by something else. Uh, and this is where lies the clue uh, to happiness. So what are those factors which actually contributes, which goes beyond happiness? So one of the you know a very celebrated quote, if I don't do, uh, I'll be, I'll be, I will not be doing the justice, is by Robert Kennedy. So he was actually running the race for American presidency in 1968, and he made this speech at University of Kansas. And he said about GDP, he said it measures uh, it measures neither our wit nor our courage, uh, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to the country. It measures almost everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And that's why he, he said that GDP is a hopeless measure. Uh, and, and then later on, we found that Tim Jackson, he proposes a degrowth theory. And he said that if the growth slows down, the country actually does better. So it's not about growth race. It's about you know, how you ensure the quality of life. Uh, and Joel Gardner, uh, his famous dissertation on rise and fall of GDP. So, you know, a lot of questions have been raised and people are talking about it. We have a country in the neighborhood. Uh, Bhutan and uh, the Bhutan talks about gross national happiness rather than gross national uh, product uh, and their gross national happiness is based on nine dimensions of happiness uh, and look at those nine dimensions psychological well-being health time use education cultural diversity and resilience good governance community vitality ecological diversity and resilience living standard so you can see income based measure is just one component in the nine dimensions uh, and therefore, they have taken life as holistic way of looking at life. So life actually is not just about money. Life is about uh, many other things which the money cannot actually buy. Uh, of course, there are many things the money can buy to make you happy. But, you know, there are many happy things that the money cannot buy. So, you know, we have to consider that. Uh, this is one of the holistic indicators available on this earth. Uh, they are the leader uh, in talking about uh, happiness. It's also called the kingdom of happiness. So if you get more time, we'll talk about it. This is a GNH framework that they use. Uh, this GNH framework is that uh, they look at people from the sufficiency domains. Uh, and then statistically, they have worked out the data on the based on the data they have collected on nine domains uh, on several factors, 33 factors, nine domains. Uh, they have divided a cutoff. 
uh, so you they have a cutoff and if you have number of a sufficiency more than that cutoff you are considered as happy and if you have a less than the cutoff you are considered not happy for example chimi and sange has got seven dimensions uh, you know happier dimensions and they are lacking only in two dimensions so they are considered as happy people but thingle dorji jampel tashi iring they are not considered happy because uh, they have not sufficient domains uh, of happiness uh, above the cutoff फिट between the sustainability and i g g g i index and therefore any country which is actually working more intensively on sdgs uh, are the one which is going to progress more on happiness front so this is just uh, one view a uh, lot of country initiatives have been taken uh, we have the complete oecd project on the measuring of the progress of society they talk about the alternative way of look, looking at the progress uh, countries initiative bhutan we have always seen brazil thailand uk australia france uae these are the countries which have actually made a lot of headway uh, in terms of measuring the well being uh, in variety of ways including happiness uh the french president sarkozy uh he constituted a commission uh, and he commissioned three nobel laureate uh, joseph stiglitz amartya sen and jean jean uh, you know paul fitossi and they have come out come up uh, come out with a report on measuring the economic pro- uh, performance and the social progress and they talked about the alternative way drifting away from the gdp based measure so you know these are some of the development that has happened uh if you go to dubai city you will see this kind of board uh, happiness street and they use something called the happiness meter the happiness meter uh, is a unique city uh, in the in uh, on this earth which actually combines happiness and technology together and to make it a smart city or a happy city of the future uh, and uh, they use uh, the real time uh, real time sentiment analysis of the people to understand how happy they are with different services including the government services there are neurological evidences of happiness and that's the reason why the happiness research is picking up so fast so one of the neurological research was that mri scan of people now people whom uh, the happy the happy baby face was shown and the defaced baby uh, uh, face was shown uh, and the longer the duration uh, of the picture which was shown uh, the mri scan actually appeared on one side of the brain uh, consistently and the patch actually increased over uh, in si- the size of the pack actually, actually increased uh, as the duration of the picture shown increased so this gives us uh, some kind of indicator that there is neurological evidence that uh, happiness gets recorded at some some place in our uh, brain there are many happy chemical that we talk about like serotonin is a ha- happy chemical that gets secreted uh, in our uh, body uh, oxytocin is another uh you know have chemical uh and uh the uh, dopamine is another chemical uh so you know neurological evidence is also seen here this is how happiness actually looks like in our brain uh the molecules what happens is that the molecules of the protein myosin uh drag a ball of endorphins along with the active filament into the inner part of the brain that is parietal cortex uh, which produces the feelings of happiness so how these feelings of happiness recorded in our brain there there are neurological evidences for that as well uh, therefore it makes a lot of sense to talk about happiness and we can see that yale university's most popular course is happiness most popular course ever is happiness so you know uh, this is how people are taking it to the uh, to the to the practical world uh, uh, jeremy bentham he talked uh, talked about uh, you know calculus of pain and pleasure 32 circumstances uh, then hap- then the, in other word uh, work uh, it was it was uh, pointed out that happiness is not entirely a personalized phenomenon uh if you think that the happiness is inner and it depends on you uh we are perhaps mistaken the happiness after a certain point of time it actually depends on factors which is not under our control and it's very important to understand uh, those factors we derive it from the society we live in so therefore our understanding about what are the sources of happiness we derive from the society is very important uh a layered is uh, another 
very exemplary work he has done. And he said that uh, our wants, uh, once we are above the subsistence level, are largely derived from the society, and they are the major factors affecting the happiness. Uh, Halliwell is another uh, scholar who has done a big work. Uh, he talked about freedom, religion, trust, and morality as an important factor affecting our happiness. Some more findings, the, uh, you know, in one of the study, the, it was said that the Americans consider happiness more to them than money, moral goodness, and even going to the heaven. Uh, in another study, 37% uh, uh, of the people on Forbes list of wealthiest Americans are less happy, found less happy than the average Americans. So these are some of the startling uh, you know, uh, evidences uh, of research work. Um, and then there is happiness increase experiments. Uh, and this was published in a peer review journal, have empirically demonstrated that individuals can be trained to be 25% happier through various training program in, uh, uh, from two to 10 weeks. So uh, we do have this uh, you know, evidence. This is one work that uh, two of us, myself and uh, Anandji published in Times of India, uh, is the latest work that we have published, uh, Need of the Hour. So what is the need of the hour? So when we talk about the need of the hour, uh, we can talk about a couple of things which can be taken as a takeaway uh, from the research and practices of happiness. The first thing that we would like to advocate is uh, mindfulness. Uh, some, there's something called the body scan meditation, which actually helps quite a lot. Uh, I'll request uh, Anandji to speak a little more on these five presets that I'm going to present uh, just in front of you. So I'm not going to talk much about mindfulness. Uh, Anandji is going to talk about mindfulness more and about this particular study. Uh, second, uh, we are advocating is called practice stoicism. So there is something called, uh, you know, a, a way of looking at things, uh, how you are uh, developing this habit of responding to a situation rather than reacting to a situation. You know, uh, this is a beautiful quote, uh, God, uh, God give me the courage to change the things I can, uh, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference between the two. So the, here lies the clues to happiness. So uh, Anand is going to explain more on that. The third I'm going to, uh, we are going to advocate is uh, active leisure. Uh, how we spend our leisure is very important. This is one of the book that has uh, come to market very recently, uh, some couple of days back, uh, Suskind, uh, A World Without Work. So he's actually looking at how the singularity is going to take place, how the AI is going to take over the world of work. And if we have less work and more leisure, do we really know how to use leisure for happiness? And there is this there is, there is a study in happiness which says that uh, the time use pattern of the millionaires are very different. Uh, they are actually into more active leisure. So it's not about just leisure time that you have for happiness. It's about how you use your leisure for happiness is more important. So you know there is a passive leisure, there is active leisure. So if you have plenty of leisure and if it is a passive leisure for you, uh, it's not going to add to happiness. So that's what the research indicates. So Anand is going to talk more on that. Fourth, uh, we are talking about is dopamine detoxing. Uh, dopamine is a happy chemical. But what it does is that if overdose of dopamine, if you start getting from some sources, we tend to incline to that sources a lot. For example, uh, mobile use. So we have just checked our mobile. We kept it on the table. Uh, and then in a flash, we again pick up the mobile and start checking if there is any, any message for me uh, in the mobile. Though we have just check the message. We don't know. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the message will not come in a flash, but well, we have this habit. So we cannot live without mobile. That's called the excessive dopamine. So excessive dopamine is the reason for you know, things like you know, sticking to mobile games, computer, music, junk food. You know, these are all uh, results of excessive dose of dopamine that you get from a particular behavior. Uh, therefore, what we need is a dopamine detoxing. So how do we do dopamine detoxing? That's very important. Uh, the fifth and the last uh, that uh, prescription for happiness would be uh, be pro-social. Uh, so act for the collective good. It's called SQ. Uh, that is spiritual quotient. Now, a spiritual quotient is not about being, being a religious uh, you know, religious caution. Religious caution and spiritual cautions are different. So just to uh, just to make, uh, make you understand this uh, difference, uh, let me just give you an example. So I have a friend doctor, and uh, he says that he is a treating patient uh, 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 of uh, diabetes. Uh, so he's a doctor treating diabetes. And he's doing a wonderful job. He's a well-celebrated doctor, uh, and he's doing a great job. 
uh, there is another doctor and he's also uh, treating patient for diabetes. Uh, and he's also an excellent doctor, he's doing good. But the second doctor says that, you know, his aim is not just to treat the patient which comes to him, but he would like to see that his whole locality and his whole city is free from diabetes. That's what the mission he's working for. So the second doctor has a SQ much higher and better than the first doctor. So SQ is about you know, uh, pursuing the lifetime pursuit or maybe you know, finding the purpose of life. Uh, so trust, compassion, friends to talk, these are the social capital which actually speaks volume about happiness. So this acronym that we have developed ourselves is called CALL, C-A-L-L. So uh, you know, just, to, just, to, just to remember it well, uh, so give yourself a call. A call means uh, adopt a curious approach to life and living. So that, that's, that's another clue to happiness. So with this talk, uh, I, you know, I'll just take a minute and talk about what are the initiatives that we have taken at Jaipuria Institute of Management before I hand it over to Ananjit to talk. Uh, first we have done is that we have actually oriented our campus with four different cores of happiness and positive education in our campus. So we have oriented our campus in a, uh, in a, on, the, on the happiness, uh, you know, on the, on, the, on the base of happiness uh, findings uh, and research. Second, uh, we developed the course called Happiness and Wellbeing, and we have offered it as an elective three credit course to our student. And this course promises to increase happiness in their life uh, after they go through this course. And this course is going very beautifully and is, is being received very well. Uh, third, happiness, we are doing constant happiness research and publications, and we share our uh, you know, writings uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, we do a lot of workshop training and talks in happiness. Uh, we also have a center for uh, sustainability and public policy under which uh, we take up this happiness uh, research. Uh, you can see our campus. This is the core, this is the outermost core uh, of our campus. So what it says is that uh, if you make outer core as green, uh, lush green, a lot of flowers and positivity, uh, it actually opens up the senses of the people who are going to visit your campus and they are ready to uh, work, they're ready to study, they're ready to deliberate. So, you know, this is uh, the first gateway of happiness or positive education. So if, uh, if the learner is not, uh, is not opening up their mind, if they are their burden, too much burden, uh, and then enter the campus, you know, the, it makes a lot of difference in their learning. So this is just to give you an idea how we do. Uh, teaching and uh, teaching and learning happiness, we do a lot of uh, happiness is another publications we had. We also worked on something called the happy school. Uh, and this is the article that we have written on happy school. Uh, we also met the chief secretary, uh, Gupta ji, uh, and uh, he visited our campus once. He delivered a lecture also. Uh, he connected us to uh, the secretary uh, uh, education and uh, through them, we also got two school uh, in Jaipur uh, to, uh, to conduct our uh, intervention, happiness intervention, uh, you know, for from five, class five to class eight, but it, we couldn't, could, couldn't take it, uh, take it up and take it forward uh, because of the pandemic. So probably, you know, after things get settled, then we'll take it, take it up further. Uh, we also worked on happiness at workplace, uh, and uh, we published this as a result of that study. Uh, we also have worked on happy city concept. So, you know, taking evidences from the rest of the world, from Europe, from US, from Dubai, from other countries, and then we try to say what a happy city is all about and what are the features uh, of a happy city. So, uh, a lot of Bhutanese officials also visited us, the top officials from Bhutan. So Professor T.S. Powdell, he was a former uh, education minister of Bhutan. He came over, uh, to, came over to Jaipur and he delivered a lecture on education for happiness. And he also delivered a lecture on SCM Ripa uh, with our collaboration. Norbu Wangchuk is another uh, education minister from Bhutan. He talked about mindfulness and happiness. And he also gave interview on Rajasthan Patrika. He was here in Jaipur. Dasho Karma Ura, he's the president of the Center for Bhutan Studies, and I worked with him very closely. Uh, I lived in Bhutan for about six, seven years. So he came over here. He's the architect of the uh, measurement part of GNH in, in Bhutan. So he has uh, the status equivalent to a minister uh, in our conferences. You can see these are the newspaper, local last time newspaper coverage uh, of uh, Mr. Wangchuk when he was here. Uh, 
he talked about happiness. Uh, this is the coverage of uh, Karma Ura when he was here. Uh, this is the local uh, newspaper coverage. Uh, and this is uh, HCM Ripa when he visited. You can see our Vanavadji is talking to the Minister of Education, uh, Professor T.S. Powder. Uh, so these are some of the things that we have done. Uh, so I'm stopping it here uh, without taking much of the time and I'm handing it over to Anandji to talk a little more on the five points that we have elaborated for 10, 15 minutes and then we can open it for question answers. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Professor Prabhat. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to, okay, my screen is not shareable, uh, browser. So I think it has to be enabled by you. Uh, okay, okay, I'm sure. So I have done, done that, so now try it. Yeah. Yes, I think it is visible now. Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, uh, I think uh, Professor Prabhat had uh, gave a very good scan of all the literature that is happening around the world on the pursuit of happiness. I think two, three, uh, you know, things to just summarize uh, what uh, Professor said so far. Happiness need not be left to chance. So I think that's the, the big takeaway. And we can systematically work both at the individual level and at the collective level to improve the quality of life and the pursuit of happiness for our citizens or individuals. So I think that's the uh, big single thing that I would uh, take away. And obviously the other thing that Professor said is that it is not a completely inner game either. It is both an inner game and an outer game. So there are things outside our, our self that we have to organize and there are th things inside ourselves that we have to organize to be able to maximize happiness. So there are, that is a second big thing that, uh, uh, you know, I sort of took away from that. That happiness need not be left to chance. It is both an inner and an outer game. So both have to be managed uh, in the best way that we can. And therefore, the prescriptions for happiness, if you have to take a look at it and say, how do we actually maximize happiness? It depends on the cohort or the set of individuals that we are talking about, their life stage and so on. And Professor Prabhat quite correctly looked at, uh, uh, you know, because we are talking to a, a set of very senior and accomplished individuals. He looked at studies which said, you know, what does contribute to a good life in the 70s and 80s and then gave the Harvard study, the longest longitudinal study on happiness. So in the same spirit, you know, I'm trying to uh, take it forward and present uh, or elaborate on the five prescriptions that we can all try and do. And we will also uncover a little bit of reasoning and science behind these prescriptions so that we can uh, convince ourselves because we need to be uh, also intellectually convinced that these are the right things to do. So we'll probably talk about it for the next, uh, you know, 10 or 12 minutes. So mindfulness. Mindfulness is, uh, you know, there's a lot of literature on mindfulness and mindfulness has also become a big uh, fad or sensation today. But to really demystify mindfulness, mindfulness is about being aware uh, in a special sort of way. And uh, why mindfulness is, there's a lot of literature or research surrounding mindfulness. There was a gentleman called John Kabat-Zinn. So he's, he was a molecular biologist at MIT. So he was actually a medical person and who studied mindfulness uh, uh, from India, China, and therefore he took it back to MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and actually created an eight-week course called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program. And out of this eight-week Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, one of the big characteristics or highlights of that is called as the body scan meditation, which is what we will shortly talk about. And he found that uh, the practice of this mindfulness-based stress reduction program actually altered the brains of the participants who participated in them. So that, that is a big finding. So it not only had a psychological impact, it even had an anatomical impact. So in our brain, there are areas of the brain that are responsible for what is called as the startle response or the fight or flight response. So where you get hijacked and say you are operating as if you want to get away from the situation, or you want to fight the situation or you, are, you get frozen in fear. So there is a region of the brain called the amygdala that is responsible for it. And those participants that went through this course actually had the region of the amygdala really shrunk in size. To make sure that his study was perfect, he divided his cohort into two. So there were a set of people who registered for his course. 
one set of people he could take them in the course and the other were wait listed simply because there was no space in the course so he really compared two equivalent people to understand that uh, by following this one will actually uh, 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 really do a lot of good to one sense of well being so in regions of the brain uh, you know that deteriorate as we age they were actually reversed in the practice of mindfulness so that's the big uh, finding that uh, john kabat zinn talked about and uh, there are five facets of mindfulness that we can all think about in our own lives so one facet of mindfulness to be present and to notice so like professor prabhat said earlier in the earlier study what are you doing now are you present in what you are doing right now so to be able to be fully present in what we are currently engaged in and this act of noticing and training yourself to notice everything that you are part of itself is a big uh, booster to mindfulness the second facet of mindfulness is what is called as description so to be able to accurately describe what you feel whether pleasant feelings or unpleasant feelings positive emotions or negative emotions to be able to accurately describe that is why the educated among the people as you saw in the earlier study they have words for what they are feeling inside and can therefore express it that is why their uh, 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 mental and physical health and longevity and good health that old age all of them were very positive because they had the facility to accurately describe what they were feeling so being very literate about our emotions being very sharp and nuanced about our emotions is again a second big thing that's a facet of mindfulness the third facet of mindfulness is acting with awareness so next time you go for a walk so uh, you might want to try to think of how your body is moving as you are walking you know how your feet are touching the ground and uh, how uh, there are various sights and smells that are uh, impacting you the person that you see opposite so acting with awareness even in the, in the in the sense of walking or doing anything or sitting or standing so acting with awareness or a bodily awareness of what we are currently doing is a third big facet of mindfulness the fourth facet of mindfulness is uh, non reactivity so when things happen to notice the kind of emotions that are welling up inside and uh, not reacting very quickly and to be able to respond so that is the fourth uh, thing and non judgment not to be able to tell ourselves that we are either good or bad at every single instance we are worthwhile or worthless at every single instance right we are helpful or not helpful we are loved or we are unloved to so not having that inner chatter of judging ourselves all the time i think that's the fifth facet of mindfulness i think if we can all start uh, asking ourselves which of these five facets are uh, something that we wish to strengthen in ourselves and every day try to focus on that aspect are we not do, are we the ones who notice or who are absent mindedly walking across uh, uh, scenarios for example scenes or are we judging ourselves too often are we reacting too often are we acting with awareness do we know how we are sitting do we know how we are standing do we know how our hand feels on the chair so those are some of the things that we can think about to see whether we are mindful or not and if we strengthen one of the facets of mindfulness then the overall mindfulness of our uh, person will increase and why mindfulness helps is because it provokes what is called as a parasympathetic response all of us are human beings have uh, uh, two kinds of systems that operate inside us one is called as the sympathetic nervous system the sympathetic nervous system gets activated for example when we are about to fall you know we want to make sure that we brace ourselves and don't fall and break ourselves so that's a system that gets activated it gets activated when we are being chased by a dog it gets activated when we are in a stressful situation so that our bodies can mobilize themselves and cope with that stressful situation but what happens over a period of time is that that sympathetic activation after the stress is over does not come back so it reaches a new state of arousal or heightened sympathetic activity and when our body has that heightened sympathetic activity it actually uh, doesn't heal as much as it should during the night when we sleep so when we are constantly aroused and tight and wound so it doesn't uh, come back to normalcy and a chronic sympathetic response in our body is responsible for accelerated aging memory loss alzheimers and many other problems that are associated with the deterioration of the body so we need to reverse that and create what is called as a parasympathetic response inside ourselves and uh, the uh, practice of mindfulness is a way to create that parasympathetic response so i'm going to just uh, uh, let kabat zin talk about uh, what is mindfulness it's just a 2 minute video 
and we'll talk about uh, a little bit about how we can do body scan meditation at any time any place uh, uh, quickly so i'm just showing this 2 minute video is it audible is it audible don't know anything at all about meditation what it really is is it's about paying attention in a systematic way and for a for no reason other than to be awake because a lot of the time if you pay attention to where your mind is at it's not in the present moment it's off someplace else either in the future or in the past you know all this we spend huge amounts of time worrying and and uh, planning and then being upset about what happened or what didn't happen in the present moment, which is the only time we have to create or to be in relationship or to love or to do anything, it gets kind of squeezed. And so we're blasting through our present moments to get hopefully to better moments at some point, whether it's the weekend or vacation in the Bahamas or whatever it is where it'll all fall together. And then, of course, it doesn't because it rains and the kids are cranky or sick or you can't go or whatever it is. So the conditions are never actually right for being in the present moment which is why we don't want to be there so much. I mean, if they were just great, then of course we'd all just be here all the time. But since it's never really satisfactory, we drive ourselves insane, really, trying to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic, as opposed to sort of understanding that we're not the Titanic to begin with. So anyway, that calligraphy is the calligraphy for mindfulness. And I just want to say that uh, in Chinese, uh, various uh, ideograms are made up of other ideograms in the character for mindfulness is made up of the ideogram for presence. That's the top one, like a little hat over the character for heart. So when you hear the word mindfulness, you have to understand it as presence of heart. So the person you saw there is uh, John Kabat-Zinn. This is the famous molecular biologist who did the study on mindfulness. And uh, uh, we are going to do one little exercise uh, with your permission on uh, the body scan meditation. So can I ask everyone, you don't have to close your eyes, but to simply uh, for, a, uh, for about 10, 15 seconds or just focus on the sensation at the sole of your feet. And you may be, your, your feet may be touching the ground and uh, uh, you might feel something, you might feel hot, cold, warm. Uh, or your feet may be touching your slippers. So if you can just feel the sole of your feet. First the right feet, then the left feet, the sole of your feet. And go to your toes, the two toes, and just notice the feeling or sensations at the tip of your toe. What exactly are the sensations at the tip of your toe? Notice the sensations on your feet directly above the heel. The sensations on the feet directly above the heel. The sensations in the place where the feet are attached to the legs. The ring where the feet are attached to the legs. If you can take your time to notice the sensations over there. And if you can take a brief moment so notice the sensations in the legs from the knee to the feet. And once you have noticed them, the sensations on the two kneecaps.
you can move upward and notice the sensations on the back of the thigh as you are seated the sensations over there and notice the sensations in the rest of the thigh the sensations on your hip your groin the sensations around your navel area the sensations on your lower back the sensations on your mid back what exactly are you experiencing in your rib cage your heart region sensations in the upper part of your body your shoulder blades upper back the joint where the hands are attached to the shoulders your arms elbows your palms the side opposite to the palms your fingers your throat your neck your lower jaw the chin your cheeks the region around your mouth your nose eyelids the eyeballs your temples eyebrows the center of your forehead the rest of your forehead your scalp the back of your head the crown of your head the sensation of breathing the diaphragm going in and out thank you so this is done in a very elaborate manner for about 20 minutes and what we have just done is a very quick glimpse of what we call as a body scan meditation and uh, doing this every day for about 20 minutes and it can be done anywhere as long as the smell around is not unpleasant so when you are in an unpleasant smell situation your mind switches to a, a an alert mode so it's not to be done when the smell is unpleasant but and there there is no uh, there should not be too much of a loud sound uh, or too much distractibility but otherwise this body scan meditation can be done at any point of time and we have done it in a very short 3 4 minute capsule but usually you take your time to spend time to scan each part of your body and the only thing that is being asked is to notice the sensations that are there not to accept them not to reject them just notice them so this is body scan meditation and a practice of this 
is expected to increase the five facets of mindfulness improve the parasympathetic or healing response reduce the sympathetic or the fight flight flee response and uh, reverse a lot of uh, ill effects of uh, aging so i request if you can try the body scan meditation every day and see for yourself whether it works for you this the second uh, uh, thing that we are practice that we are talking about is the stoic response and all of you have been in very senior positions uh, you know in, in and serving the country in very very critical posts and you had a lot of uh, uh, influence and power when you were working in the organization in the setup and in the office now there are two uh, uh, kinds of uh, changes that i see you know in such individuals people who have been in very responsible positions who have been at the center driving a lot of things and therefore they are very busy throughout their lives so when they uh, get into this zone of retirement either they inappropriately carry forward that sense of uh, control influence and they believe that everything can be changed by them and therefore they don't accept uh, well enough and gracefully enough that there are things that are going to be that way and we can't do much about it or a second category of individuals who will so dramatically feel that okay i am up no good now you know my power has gone and therefore see your identity entirely from the lens of your occupation what you did the last post that you held etc and uh, a stoic person will actually will have a very accurate estimate of whether this thing is under their control or not under their control and to constantly strive to accurately assess whether something in front of us is up to us which we can change in which case we should not hesitate and hold ourselves back are things that i cannot do much about therefore to accept very gracefully and completely that this is not going to be something that i can change and that attitude is called as the stoic attitude and the practice of stoicism um, is expected to help people uh, really navigate the challenges of life in a very 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 big way so modern psychological therapy called the acceptance commitment theory therapy or the cognitive behavior therapy is originally founded on this greek uh, philosophy called stoicism A lot of literature on the net is there on stoicism so if you are interested more you can probably uh, uh, look up to them so that's the second uh, uh, sort of thing so are we stoic or are we not stoic so if we look back at the last 2 3 days of the incidents of our life have we did we react stoically or uh, respond stoically or did we react and uh, we did not have an accurate estimate of whether it was under our control or not under our control so that's the second sort of review that we can do almost every day so my body scan meditation to improve our mindfulness to see which of the five facets of noticing describing acting with awareness non reactivity and non judgment that we need to work on and second is to look and uh, take a stoic attitude the third is active leisure and as professor prabhat said even millionaires uh, were on an average less happier one third of millionaires were less happier than the average american and the fact that beyond a point that up to a point money increases happiness but beyond a point it does not uh, further increase happiness so um, yeah, this study by professor ashley williams uh, at harvard so she tried to look at and this is where bhutan's uh, domain of time use also comes from uh, you know this kind of a literature that if you look at uh, uh, so to be able to enjoy leisure uh, itself requires a lot of education and refinement and i think all of you you know in this group are highly educated highly exposed in the world you have lots of things but then at this point it will be a good idea to further spread and widen your interests in in a large variety of things and then indulge in them and actively learn something actively do something and i think this uh, this very idea of jigyasa is a is a brilliant idea it's a socially structured way to uh, to improve our sense of active leisure so it's an it's a great example so if we are doing something for ourselves uh, at our time at our pace uh, a classic example being a hobby and that sense of active leisure actually increases our sense of happiness so if we have a trade off between money and time what should we do is something that we ask and there are some people i have seen uh, uh, you know retired uh, senior professionals like ours they tell themselves hey so i have all the time in the world let me do this uh, spend my time and do this work why engage in a hell or why do this why do that so and studies have found that when we have to decide between time and money and uh, simply the fact that time is finite and money is potentially less finite 
so it is a good idea to get time for active leisure right by giving up money so that's the uh, that's the studies that's what they have found so enjoying a lot of active leisure uh, cultivating a wide set of interests and doing something in your own time having one hour every day where you would do something for your own sake uh, and in a less guilty manner not in a guilty manner but in a less guilty manner is a very important ingredient of a happy life so active leisure is a third sort of prescription one hour every day where you do something for yourself for nobody else and the fourth thing professor prabha talked about with a very good example of the mobile phone so there are multiple chemicals that are responsible for happiness so happiness itself is not a single thing it has got many dimensions to it so the uh, dopamine dimension is one in which the imminent reward right the pleasure of getting a reward that is going to come just now uh, is what uh, dopamine is responsible for that chemical secretion but as like professor prabhat said like if you eat too much sweet uh, your coffee tastes very bitter after that right so similarly um, uh, dopamine has some negative impact on the brain cell so what happens is our body uh, will reduce the sensors that are responsible for sensing dopamine so what happens is it will reduce the sensitivity of that just like when your tongue is burnt it is not able to taste well because some of the cells that are able to taste are dead similarly your brain actually uh, reduces those uh, receptors <coughs> and therefore more dopamine is required for for you to get the same pleasure and that is when addiction happens so that's why addiction is called dope or doping it comes from the word dopamine whereas serotonin where you sense have a sense of confidence a sense of contentment is not uh, is not down regulated like that it doesn't suffer the impact that dopamine suffers so serotonin is a good happy chemical a sense of confidence a sense of mastery a sense of play that is a very good happy chemical <coughs> similarly endorphin is a happy chemical endorphin comes when you have do physical exercise if you do moderate physical exercise your body actually will generate some chemicals called endorphins to uh, recover from pain and the good thing about endorphin is that the that same chemical also repairs the damaged cells in the body and when your damaged cells get repaired or replaced yeah, the chance that you would get into uh, you know tumor like situations reduce so that's the uh, uh, benefit of moderate exercise on uh, long term health and the study that uh, uh, you know professor prabhat talked about oxytocin is a uh, happy chemical or a relationship chemical so oxytocin is what gets secreted when a mother uh, gives birth to a child in large quantities that is when you, you would see that uh, pregnant women in addition to the fact that we we keep them safe also uh, suffer less from disease in the year of pregnancy or the year of childbirth or one year one and a half years downstream you would notice that uh, you know maternal health is surprisingly high that's because of the generation of oxytocin uh, a chemical that is uh, secreted when we like somebody or when we hug somebody and that actually increases uh, or uh, increases our immune response so oxytocin is also a happy chemical and that is the uh, reason why we need to be pro social so pro social is where you are uh, 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 you know you have someone to talk to someone you can count on but those are things that are uh, that are little bit chance right so depending on how our lives are do we stay near our dear ones or do we stay far away from our dear ones all that can change because of life circumstances but what is under our control is uh, even if you are walking and even if you are uh, looking at someone and even if they are not your friends but they are only your acquaintances the act of saying hello good evening how are you a small chit chat acknowledgement smile to our drivers you know to somebody on the street so even those little acknowledgements which may not be intensely social interactions like our near and dear ones even those little acknowledgements are expected to have lot of benefits on our health and uh, uh, health uh, uh, in the uh, 70s 60s 80s and so on so that is the uh, power of pro sociality so collective singing collective praying doing something for together like for example all of you have come together in a forum and if you all you know adopt a purpose and do something what you can do that is being pro social so these are the five uh, uh, sort of things that we want us to reflect on and think about expectation uh, adopt an attitude of stoicism and uh, uh, create time for ourselves and pursue an active leisure 
not a uh, passive leisure active leisure uh dopamine frequent dopamine detoxing so that you give yourself a break before you indulge in something again so that's dopamine detoxing and uh, increase the amount of pro sociality by even simply acknowledging what is around us uh are the people around us are doing us little chit chat even about the weather is is these are five things that uh, we can consider and see whether it works for us or not uh, in leading a more healthier and happier life uh, uh, thank you